Okay, great. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Gary Buchanan. I'm the director for the Division of Science, Research, and Environmental Health. And I'm very pleased today to introduce this topic on Barnegat Bay. This all stems from the governor's comprehensive action plan, 10-point plan, we call it. If you want more information on any of these plans, you can go to, up to our website. It's on the front page. Uh, just click on Old Barney, the lighthouse. And again, primarily we're going to be talking today about uh, Plan 9, fill in the gaps on research. Again, Plan 9, comprehensive research, several <coughs> objectives here to support, to support water quality improvement uh, and supporting nutrient criteria. That was Plan 7, which we work closely with adopt more rigorous water quality standards. So you'll be hearing uh, Tom talk about that. Establish the baseline conditions of the bay. Uh, the last comprehensive survey, which wasn't totally comprehensive, was in the 1970s for the Oyster Creek plant. Fill in critical data gaps, and these ga data gaps were put together by stakeholders, uh, state federal agencies, uh, in, in uh, conjunction with the Barnegat Bay Partnership. We're looking to advance habitat restoration on the bay and provide, most importantly, data to address management questions and an action plan. We also support other plans. I mentioned seven, also eight and ten. There are ten research projects. On the left is the list. Everything from looking at benthic invertebrates, zooplankton, phytoplankton, fish, crabs, biological modeling, and even freshwater and salt marshes. Again, just across the top here we have the objectives, and you can see all of them support uh, filling in data gaps and comprehensive baseline surveys. Some are for food safety, certainly tourism and recreation. These species are important. We have hard clams, crabs, fish. Uh, power plants closing in 2019, so we wanted information before that closed. Supporting the water quality model that's being produced under Plan 7 and, and nutrient criteria. So the current status, uh, 10 projects over three years, they're all complete. They had close to $4 million budget. You add it all up, it's over 30 years, or 30 research years, if you will. So it's a, a robust database. Years 1 and 2 have been posted on the uh, DSR website, and year three report should be posted very soon. Uh, assessment and recommendations, we briefed the commissioner. That was done uh, about two weeks ago. We were waiting on the final modeling, uh, water quality modeling, under Plan 7 by USGS before we can make final assessments. Uh, we've been doing communications, we've been to Rutgers University, Monmouth University, and last week we had a, an all-day research forum in conjunction with the Barn Barnegat Bay Partnership, which was very, very, uh, excuse me, very successful at Ocean County College, and I already mentioned this. So, with that, I'd just like to take uh, a, a brief moment to congratulate Tom Belton. Tom was the research coordinator for this for the past close to five years. Um, highly successful. He's my rock star. We wouldn't be here today without him. I'd also like to say that this is his kind of uh, victory lap. He's retiring at the end of the year. If anyone would like to attend his uh, retirement dinner, it's December 2nd at 5 p.m. See Terry Tucker or Gwen Hale, if you'd like to join us. So with that, I'd like to congratulate Tom and in introduce him to give you the complete uh, seminar. Tom? Yeah. Uh, click the song so I could wander around. Push and hold. Push and hold. Can you hear me now? 
Um, thank you, Gary. It's kind of <coughs> um, this, this has been a really great opportunity for me. Um, I, I am a marine biologist. I was hired to the department back in 1980, and the first thing they asked me to do was to grind up fish in a blender and analyze them for pesticides. <laughs> it wasn't what I had in mind when I went to graduate school, but you know, I get paid bills. Um, over the years, I've been involved in a lot of hazardous waste site investigations, um, multiple different kind of projects, and in this last piece of my career, it was really nice to be able to go back and use the stuff I studied in school, which is marine ecology. Um, this um, project, as Gary mentioned, you know, I came out of um, a stakeholder process in which we've, we've all been around a while. We've been talking about Barnica Bay through previous administrations. Um, we've had a number of stakeholder meetings where we got feedback from the public on what they thought was wrong with the bay and what we could do about it. And out of that came that list that Gary mentioned before, that showed up before, these 10 different projects. Um, the reason that Barnegat Bay is, is in so much trouble is because it's got a lot of stresses on it. This is the short list. Um, it's got eutrophication problems from um, too many nutrients that are coming into the system. Uh, we as a department dealt with that somewhat back in the 1970s when we regionalized the sewage treatment plants and shipped a lot of the effluents offshore, which then didn't go into the bay. When we did that, we also removed a lot of the coliforms and the bacteria from the water, and as a result, we, op we opened up a lot of the shell beds that were closed at that time. Um, the power plant operation, as Gary mentioned, uh, Oyster Creek Nuclear and Generating Station was the first nuclear power plant sited and built in the United States. It was built in 1969 and it went online in 1970, and it's in a design that you would never get approved today. It's a once-through system that sucks the water through the bay through the cooling uh, system and then releases its heated water into the bay. Um, that plant as part of the governor's action plan is scheduled for early closure uh, in 2019. Um, habitat loss, I'll talk about that. Hardened shorelines are going to be important as far as jellyfish are concerned. Uh, reduced freshwater input. Um, with sea level rise, we might find that some of that water that we took out of the system and now sending it to the ocean might be useful in keeping salt wedges you know, like further down the estuary. Uh, we'll talk about dredging and boating impacts on the bay, um, marine operations. Of course, climate change is critical. Anything that we do here, we're going to have to reassess again, probably in 10 years um, because of that. Uh, chemical contaminants and trash and floatables. Uh, I'd like to put this slide up because it kind of shows you where we were and where we are. This is a picture of um, the uh, Fork of River and Oyster Creek in 1931. Here's the Fork of River here flowing into the bay. Here's Oyster Creek. And what you see here is a typical coastal salt marsh, a maritime forest, uh, very little population, and this is what it looks like today. Here's the nuclear, the Oyster Creek Nuclear Generating Station. Uh, as you can see, what they did was they, they cut a canal through, and it pulls water out of the river through the plant for cooling purposes, and then dumps the water back in, and it comes out here in a thermal plume at this section. What you can see in this slide also, besides this industrial facility, is that all throughout the day, we've, we've created these lagoon communities where we took a, a salt marsh and gouged it open deep enough to put boats in and then put houses in there. Uh, there are also a number of marinas up here, uh, which are also sources of contaminants and other materials, you know, like uh, that could fall into the water. See so people sitting by the door, you come in if you want, there's more seats back here. In the, um, the, uh, the power plant itself, for those of you who are not uh, uh, aware of this, we regulate not just nuclear power plants, but anybody that takes water out of a flowing system uh, for, I believe it's the 316 program under the Clean Water Act. We allow them to use that water, and we know that it impacts biology, but we have a formula for uh, addressing that. In this instance, uh, when fish larvae primarily get pulled into the plant, they can either become impinged on the screens or entrained into the plant, and there's a loss of life as a result. So when this power plant goes offline in 2019, it's going to become really critical for us to understand what's going to happen. Because for 45 years, it's been removing a certain part of the biomass from the system. Um, this slide shows um, one of the big drivers for changes in Barnegat Bay has been land use changes. Um, this is a, um, a schematic that shows that over a third of the bay has been um, built out, changes surface runoff and groundwater flows, increases nutrient and chemical and sediment inputs into the bay. And lastly, there's a habitat loss, alteration, and fragmentation. So you can also see that a significant amount, uh, here up to 1972, it was 1984, a lot of the build-out is taking place from north to south. 
So southern parts of the bay are less developed than it is in the north. And as a result, a lot of the sources of the nutrients and the pollutants and the other things are happening uh, up in northern Barnegat Bay versus Little Lake Harbor and Mantelope Bay here. <coughs> Um, this is a really neat schematic that was done by Rick Lathrop from uh, Rutgers University. It gives you an idea of the kind of impact that Buildout has on, on a, these systems. This is a picture of Sunken Branch, you know, like in Barnegat Bay back in uh, probably the 1970s. Um, and this is what it looks like today. Um, this is rampant overdevelopment and suburbanization. And it gets even worse if you just take Sunken Branch and look at this one. It's a nice little creek going through the system, and that's what it looked like some trees and sand. And that's what it looks like now. So um, this is obviously not a sustainable way to build. And I think we're kind of learning a lesson after the fact. But as I said, there are huge parts of Barnegat Bay and Little Lake that don't look like this now. So maybe we can do something about that. Um, you'll hear in this talk that nitrogen is one of the bad actors. So some of the fertilizers we put on our lawns, you know, like septic systems in the past that would have been you know, like dischargers from point sources, um, cause cultural eutrophication. Um, in which too much of that can cause algal blooms, which then some other submerged aquatic vegetation that can have impacts on wildlife. Um, this is an example of, of that. You know, like in reality, you really want some nutrient into the system so you get optimal seagrass habitat in the bottom. If you have too little, you don't get enough zoster or the seagrass growing. Uh, if you get enough, you get lots and lots of crabs and shellfish use this as habitat and fish protect themselves from other you know, like predators in the system. But if you get too many, uh, too much nutrient in the system, what happens is you start to get epiphytes growing on the seagrass. You start to get lots and lots of algae that creates turbidity, and the sunlight can't get down to the bottom, and they die off. So the relationship between the nutrients and, and the critical habitat at the bottom of the bay. Um, so um, as we mentioned before, Gary showed you this series of 10 projects that we designed for this assessment. Uh, the assessment was, was, was pretty heady, you know, like it was, you know, like, look at all the issues in Barnegat Bay, um, there are a lot of different issues. It's not just about nitrogen. We have people in the department in the Marine Fisheries Administration, they manage marine fisheries. Uh, they don't you know, think about nitrogen, they think about sustainable fisheries like hard clam and blue crab and things like that. Uh, other people manage, you know, like uh, through the land use program, they manage the salt marshes that are in the system. And they think about salt marshes all the time in wetlands. So we essentially took these projects and for the purposes of organizing them to come up with a series of management recommendations, put them into these management categories. So the management categories are aquatic life use assessment and site-specific water quality criteria development, characterizing environmental sensitive areas, natural resource assessment and management for sustainable fisheries, ecosystem-based management modeling, and water quality modeling support. Um, now when we did this, you know, I, um, we're not an esoteric academic institution. When we do research here at DP, we, we do pragmatic research. We design studies to answer questions that people in the department need answers to. Sometimes it's because there's a data gap. Sometimes it's because they need a model in order to see if it's something is, is affecting something that they're managing. So in order to keep the researchers on target for what we wanted, we posed a series of charge questions to them. And we met with them periodically over these three years to make sure that they were paying attention to the charge questions. And so the focus of the research uh, really kind of revolved around these charge questions. And I'll give you an example of what these charge questions look like. So the purpose of aquatic life use assessment, you specifically wanted to know, can biological indicators and estuaries identify the level and causes of ecological impairment? And the extent to which impairments are related to nutrients, phosphorus, and nitrogen. That would allow us to manage the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus coming into the system. But specifically because we have to, if we establish a criteria, uh, for those of you who are not involved in the water quality criteria side of the department, once you establish a criteria, we have to go back and monitor on a regular basis. So we have to get something that is implementable and economically feasible for our water quality guys to go out in the field and collect it. So one of the questions we asked is, you know, like, could you also um, collect the data and be reduced to streamline from the research method methodology into a cost-effective manner? For example, fewer sites in our sampling time to support an annual routine monitoring program make it very functional. So these are the kind of questions we posted again for this one uh, charge area. These are some of the research projects that we, we funded you know, like to address this issue of Barnegat Bay. Up until recently, well, we still do this now, is that the way, the only water quality criteria we have for the estuaries in New Jersey is dissolved oxygen. The dissolved oxygen standard is a kind of a, 
it's a standard that's coming in late. If, if the DO really goes down, it's kind of too late to do anything about what's causing the DO to collapse. What we'd like to know is what's the relationship between the nutrients that drives the DO. So to do that, we asked three different researchers to see if they could develop stressor response models using different indicator organisms. Uh, the first one we want to talk about is uh, Dr. Marina Potapova from um, the uh, Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel. She studies diatoms. Diatoms are minute algae. You'll see some of them on the bottom of the slide here. And the really great thing about diatoms is that they grow silica shells. So their cell walls are made of silica, the same material used to make glass. So when they die, they fall to the bottom of the sediments, they, they decompose the, the organic part. We still have a representative of what those diatoms look like. We also know a lot about the autoecology of diatoms. People have been studying them as individual species for years. So we know which diatoms like high nutrients and which ones like no, no, low nutrients. So you can create a model which allows you to predict which species of diatoms essentially would respond to a high or low nutrient condition situation. In this instance, um, we sampled you know, like over 100 locations throughout Barnaby Bay, um, and we did come up with a model which allows us to look at um, changes in salinity, total dissolved phosphorus, and chlorophyll A in the water column. However, for nitrogen, the model only worked in the sediments. They couldn't get it to work in the water column. And that's a real problem for us because it has to reflect, we don't have, we're not worried about sediment criteria, we really want water quality criteria. Um, so in this instance, the um, nitrogen in the sediments was responding to poor water the concentration of the nutrients that were in the sediments themselves. So we're still working on trying to make this work for nitrogen. Um, but we did establish that there were a reference community of, of diatoms in the bay. We actually dated them uh, going back to the 1800s. Uh, there's a process called paleolinology. Um, you'll see a slide about this in a little while, in which we can actually drive a core down into a marsh. And the sediments that were laid down 100 years ago still have diatoms in them, though present then. And we could use our model to predict what the water quality was like 100 years ago from developing these models. This is the example of, of what I was just talking about. Here are four locations that we did sediment cores in Barnegat Bay. One way up in the north where we have all those people and where all the nutrients are. Another one down by above the nuclear power plant. And another one down in this more pristine area or at least less built out area in uh, Little Lake Harbor. The way we do this is we take a core and we drive it into the marsh. We physically just push it down, and it has a little septum at the bottom, so when you stop, it closes up, and you can pull the core out. And when you pull the core out, you then slice it up like a cake. You just take a little strata, and once you get each one of those strata, you can analyze how much nitrogen is present in that strata. You can analyze how much phosphorus, what kind of uh, diatoms are present in that, that slice of, of, the, of the core. And, but the thing that's really cool is that we can date the cores. We use uh, season 137 and lead to 10, as a way to date the core. Uh, season 137 is, is a byproduct of above ground nuclear explosions, which peaked in 1964 through 1967, and then was banned by the, the salt treaties. So when you're down in the core, you can, you can identify this peak, and you know you're at 1967. And then you look at the, uh, the lead to 10 data, and that goes up in a linear fashion, and then you can date the core. And that's what this core shows. If you think of this as an example of the core here, this is 2009, that's at the top of the core. That's where we put this one. And as you go down through the core, it goes back to 1721. Now we see here on top are different names of species of diatom algae that we pulled from the core. Uh, and what you'll notice is that we could actually create zones. Up until 1949, there was a whole group of diatoms that lived in Barnegat Bay that are very different than the ones that are living here uh, more recently. And we know that the ones that, that down here at the bottom are the ones that live in a less polluted or less nitrogen-rich environment. So in a way, this is kind of a report card on the bay. If you think about this, if we put the bay on a, on a nutrient diet, which we may begin, begin to do with this, the fertilizer that we put in place, there'll be less you know, like reactive phosphorus coming into the system. Theoretically, you'd expect this to push its way back in the other direction and get more of these other species over time. It also allows you to create a reference condition um, it's kind of interesting, you know, you'll, you'll note that, you know, like when nutrient levels in Barnegat Bay started to spike, they happened after the Civil War and after World War II, when development started to happen, you know, like in, in, in the southern part of New Jersey. Uh, the second project we looked at was by another phycologist named Dr. Ling Ren and Don Charles, also from the Academy of Natural Sciences at Drexel. Uh, Ling Ren um, looked instead of diatoms and algae that grow on the bottom muds of the bay, she looked at the phytoplankton, which grow in the water column. 
the ones that float and move, you know, like with the water as it comes through the system, which is really the base of the food web. It's the velt in Africa. It's the, you know, the, the, the base, you know, like that creates the carbon that feeds, you know, like all herbivores and goes up the food web. In this instance, uh, what we did was in working with um, the Division of Water Monitoring Standards, you know, like Marine Monitoring Group, they collected samples from us every time we went out and did a sample, you know, like during intensive surveys and, and weekly surveys over a two year period of time, three year period of time. And then we took a bottle and gave it to Link. She brought it back to the lab, she filtered it down, she uh, put it on slides, acid washed it, and then she identified which algae were present you know, like in the water column. And we did that through the season. So we do know, you know, like in, in estrogen ecology and, and any kind of ecology, whether it's lakes or streams, that in the spring you get what's called a bloom, you know, like an early algal bloom. Um, that algae grows very quickly and then it gets eaten up by the zooplankton and disappears, and then another bloom comes in behind it. Those typical successional phases we saw in Barnegat Bay. But we also saw some several harmful algal blooms. Um, Gary mentioned earlier that one of the things, that one of the criteria for uh, our selection of projects was you know, like management strategies. Um, our, you know, like, um, uh, water, Division of Water Monitoring Standards also collects samples in support of the Shellfish Sanitation Act, uh, which we manage you know, the shellfish beds in New Jersey. And there are paralytic shellfish toxins that come from these harmful algal blooms that could cause us to shut down a shell bed if they're present. So we wanted to see if there was any relationship between these HABs and the nutrients as well, uh, looking at red tides and brown tides. Um, and then lastly, one of the things we wanted to do was create a bio, an index of biotic integrity. We, we created an index using algae that we could use, again, you know, like every year to go back and see if the water quality had changed based on the input of this data. And this last element is we, we have most of our, our uh, work with um, uh, Dr. Wren has been very, very promising. Um, she's found that 50, what, what she did was, the index of biotic integrity was actually developed in, in Chesapeake Bay. It's based on taking the algae species that we have and putting them into an index based on whether they're sensitive to light intensity, whether they respond to inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus, and you can create an index of those that are in good, bad, or excellent shape. In this instance, when we did that, we found that 50% of the sampling events uh, were classified as poor and mixed poor conditions indicating the present day water quality is often undesirable from a nutrient perspective as far as the algae are concerned and the water column. And we know that there are turbidity events, we know that there are blooms in the bay, so this kind of makes sense. Um, we also know that a lot of those blooms, you know, like essentially they don't last long in Barnegat Bay because the bay is so shallow, it's wind driven and it kind of breaks up and they, they don't last. But under drought conditions, you could probably, and this has happened in the past, I think in, 19, in 2000 to 2004, we had a series of brown tides uh, that did cause some, some really DO uh, conditions, low DO conditions in the bay, and hypoxia. So that was um, Ling Ren's study. Gary Tagon, this is the third study to support this management activity. He's a benthic ecologist, and he looked at benthic invertebrate community monitoring and indicator development. His study involved going to 100 different sites throughout Barnegat Bay that were selected on a random basis, dropping a ponar grab sample down to the bottom and pulling some sediment off the bottom. We then screen it. Uh, we then look for what, what's living there, what kind of worms, what kind of crabs, what kind of organisms that are typically in the bay. And uh, this, has been, this has been utilized, it's utilized by DEP already on the freshwater side. We have a macro invertebrate index that we use to you know, like assess water quality in the state. So Gary took these data and he put them through four different indices that were developed either by EPA um, or by other uh, European Union and other groups and developed a set of benthic invertebrate biological indices that we could potentially use in a routine monitoring program to assess biological integrity. And when Gary ran these, um, the way uh, these are graded is the uh, poor condition is in orange, and this is a map of Barnegat Bay. You can see that the only places they're really poor is in the mouth of you know, like Tom's River and the Tetacon River up here in the north where all the people are, where all the nutrients are. But for the rest of the bay, it looks like it's in pretty good shape. So from this perspective, all, all indices of habit, habitat quality uh, characterize the majority as being not degraded, good, or of high quality. And this is, this is where we as scientists get into this kind of dilemma with the public, because what we have is two indices. One says 60% of the bay is horrible in the water column, and the other says 100% of the bay is, is really great on the bottom. As an ecologist, it kind of makes sense. So what's happening is the nutrients are coming in, all of the, the eutrophic condition is happening in the water column, but it's not getting translated down to the bottom. So from my perspective, that tells me that there's problems there, but the bay ain't dead. <laughs> you know, it's not killing all the things that are on the bottom. So 
But if we wanted to move forward to develop you know, our criteria, we probably need both indices and not just one. Um, this is the, the one slide that we asked Gary to develop. And one of the things we wanted to do was use these indices to relate to nitrogen. So we could pick a number, pick a criteria of nitrogen that we might want to limit coming into the bag. The dilemma we had with these other two studies was that all the organisms that we analyzed essentially were responding to salinity more strongly than they were to nutrients. Because the top of Barnegat Bay is only like 20 to 15 parts per thousand of, 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 of salt and sodium, whereas down at the bottom it's like the ocean. So we had this similarity, like this gradient of salinity. Gary was the only one that really was able to come up with a suggestive method using just, I'm sorry, using just uh, sensitive species at the bay and here's the proportion of sensitive species on a scale on the left side and the concentration of nitrogen. And what we find is that regardless of what the salinity was like, you still get a decrease in response. The sensitive species drop out as nitrogen goes up. So we're hoping to be able to use this model um, to you know, like, uh, possibly hone in on what level along this distribution here is it that we were willing to accept that will be protective of the environment for designated uses in, in New Jersey waters. So that was... Um, the first you know, like area which we looked at, which was developing standards. Uh, the second area we wanted to look at was natural resource assessment and management. As I said, everybody in the department is not just thinking about nitrogen. People who work in freshwater and marine fisheries and endangered species programs think about organisms. Um, so in this instance, uh, we asked the question, uh, has the population of urbanization uh, affected the fin fish and blue crabs in the bay? Um, is there a gradient? As I said before, you know, like the northern part of the bay is built out, the southern is not. If you went in and you sampled throughout the bay, would we see some differential distribution of these species? Is there a change or loss of preferred habitat for fish? Uh, is there a perspective on sustainable commercial fisheries in the bay? Uh, the commercial recreational fisheries in New Jersey accounts for billions of dollars in, in our income. So it's very important to all of us. Um, and, uh, and lastly, what's the long ecological perspective for a balanced food web in the system? Uh, to this extent, what we did was we worked with Ken Abel. Ken Abel, uh, he runs the Rutgers University Marine Field Station down in Tuckerton. And he worked with uh, Tom Griffiths and Paul Jerboff from Rutgers and Rider Universities. And the way they designed their study, and here's Barnegat Bay again, to look at this organization gradient, was they created these clusters. Um, and there's one, so there's one in the south, two, three, four, five. In the south, number one is down in Little Lake Harbor, which is very pristine, it's by the, by the field station mostly salt marsh, um, it's not built out at all. And then as you work your way forward, you go by the Barnegat Inlet, it's, it's more built out. And then by the time you get up to where the power plant is, it's much more urbanized. So in this instance, what we did was uh, we sampled along the urbanization gradient. In each one of these clusters, we did trolls from a boat. We dropped the net off the back of the boat and scraped up what was on the bottom, and we counted everything that was there, all the fish. We also went into the creeks that fed into the water there. Uh, we did a larval assessment. We, uh, at night, at, usually at midnight, you know, like on an incoming tide, put nets off bridges and pulled out the larval fish that really kind of move around all in the evening. And then lastly, we put gill nets out. And the gill nets captured a lot of the larger uh, life history of the fish. Um, and um, Paul Jiboff went out and placed pots for capturing crabs, which he tagged and then released. And we tracked where the crabs went from like, the size of the crabs at different locations throughout the bay. Um, the results that uh, they generated showed that there was no urbanization grade. So again, that's really good news because the fish are big, so they could go in if it gets really dead, so they could swim someplace else. But the kind of fish we expected to find up here were the fish that we, you would normally find out. Uh, the same thing was true down here. In addition, we compared with data from the late 1970s when they did the environmental impact statements when they, they cited the nuclear power plant. And the data we collected today doesn't look that dissimilar from what they, they collected back then. So that's really good news. However, the thing that's kind of interesting was that the fall response over these decades suggests that some resident cool water migrant species are less abundant and have been replaced by warm water migrants, um, which means that this is a global warming signature. This is one of the first empirical sets of data that we have that you know, things are changing you know, like as far as the uh, warming waters is concerned. Um, so this is uh, an interesting finding. Um, the other uh, important uh, species that we manage here in New Jersey as, as a commercial species is hard clam. And the Bureau of Shell Fisheries is, is responsible for a lot of the data collection associated with this. Uh, there are two studies on this page. The top one is a hard clam survey that was done by Kira Dakine and Mike Celestino 
from the NJDP Bureau of Shell Fisheries. Um, we went out and we, we've only done really three surveys of hard climate wide the bay. One we did in the 1980s, we did another one in 2001, and then we did another one in 2012, 11 and 12. Uh, and Little Lake Harbor here have found that um, the estimated, there was a 37% uh, 37 increase, 32% increase from 2001. There was a 57% decline from the 1980s. The hard clams in New Jersey, at least in Barnegat Bay, have been on a decline steadily since, since the 1980s. Uh, the dilemma is we're not really unsure whether this is related to pollution or overfishing. Um, as Bob Schuster likes to point out to me, like when we opened up the shell beds after, you know, like we, we regionalized the sewage treatment plants, you know, because the, the coliforms went down, everybody went in and started taking clams out of the system. So they're, they're, we don't have a clam survey that's a dockside survey that allows us to match the in-water abundance numbers with what fishermen are taking out versus what may be affected by pollution. Uh, Kira also went down and looked at um, Barnegat Bay itself. In this instance, there was a 23% decrease. So the decrease is continuing. Um, we know that's happening. The question is why? Uh, that's why we funded the next study. This study here was done by Mo uh, Monica Bozzelli, John Coyder, and Jeff Fleming from Rutgers University. Uh, Monica felt that part of the problem might be the food quality. Hard clams are filter feeders, and then they typically get what they want out of the water column. And if the food quality, which is primarily the algae that we're talking about, the lame rent phytoplankton data, um, if there's a, a significant change from really nutritious, you know, like algae that have you know, high lipid content and high organic content to something like blue green algae, which are much smaller, or pica plankton that are much tinier that go right through their gills, that they really wouldn't, you know, like sustain and uh, sustain and affect their growth. So what we did here was we, we got a lot of spat, we had really small clams and put them in cages and placed them in the bay at different locations from north to south. And then she would go back on a weekly basis and measure them to find out how quickly they were growing, what size changes. Um, and then we would match her data with Ling Ren's data to see if that was related to the type of plankton that were growing in the system. She also did a reproductive study for us um, to see if you know, it wasn't just growth that was affecting them. And to do that, she would like cut out part of the uh, reproductive organ and do histopathology to see if uh, some hard clams are more fecund in some areas than others, which again might be related to food quality. Because if an organism is like stressed, it's not going to put its energy into developing gonads, you know, like in things that allow for reproduction. It'll do it into, into sustaining its growth. So this is the work that Monica did, which indicates that um, for the purposes of restoration goals and activities in the future, we might want to put down you know, like some of our restoration spat in places where the food quality is better and the habitat is better. Um, now I'm going to talk about something different, jellyfish. Um, I'll do something different. Uh, this is a schematic, as, as you may know, stinging sea nettles are, are kind of a, a, a real pain to people swimming in northern Barnegat Bay. In order to um, you really can't manage jellyfish. Um, but you can try to understand why they're there and, and what you might want to do about them. When you study jellyfish, the thing is to, to recognize that like any invertebrate, they have multiple life stages and they go through different metamorphoses. In this instance, if you look up here on the left, uh, schistosoma is a you know, like form of the jellyfish sea nettle that's attached to a structure and it, it develops these polyps. And as the polyp grows, it creates these strobilating structures, which then it releases into the water column as a microscopic aphyra, which eventually changes again into a medusa, which is the thing that we all think of the jellyfish. But before it got there, it had two different stages of development. And then it gets up into the water column, and this is the stinging phase that you, you swim into. <coughs> um, and then what happens is it creates planulas, which can then attach, and they actually can stick onto a, a, a surface over winter, and they overwinter that way and you know, like go through a, a hard winter, and then the next year they start over again. Uh, we uh, funded Dr. Paul Bologna from Monk, uh, uh, Monmouth University and Jack Gaynor uh, to look at jellyfish distribution in Barnegat Bay. And the way we did that was um, we know that uh, sting sea nettles are restricted in the adult form, the polyp form, to a certain salinity and, and, and temperature regime. If you get out of that salinity temperature regime, they tend to fall apart, and they, they really can't live. And that regime happens to be in this area in Barnegat Bay, um, in the upper section. So what Paul did was uh, he set up sampling stations on a transect on north and south of the bay, and then went in and sampled um, different levels of jellyfish through the system. 
uh, over, uh, the, over this uh, growing season. Um, we, we did find, um, there it is, <coughs> I guess on that slide. <laughs> um, what we did find was uh, the, thing that, the question we had for him was, why is thing seen now seem to be on the increase recently in buying a bag? The policy hard surfaces for pilot development. Um, you may, some of you have been around for a while know that we used to essentially allow people to put pilings in the creosote and arsenic, and then we essentially told people to stop doing that because we were releasing toxins into the waterway. Um, but what they did was they kept a lot of the polyps and attached it to the wood. So now we use essentially uh, these, these non-reactive uh, areas uh, that are plastic in the environment. The polyps seem to be having a better time or an easier time sticking to them. Um, Sea nails can also live in degraded environments. Jellyfish can thrive in low DO conditions, turbid conditions, so they're a good competitor, and they'll outcompete other species and eat them. So they won't be eating themselves. Um, the data that Paul collected showed that <coughs> sea nettle blooms are being driven both by top-down processes, depredation and competition. So it's actually eating some of the things, the, the, the larval fish that, if they grew up a little bit, would eat them. Um, and it's bottom up. These eutrophication effects, like anoxia, give them an advantage. Uh, one of the things we're finding is that a lot of these um, algae are expanding their range into the south to Little Lake Harbor. And the way they're doing that is they're moving into those lagoons I mentioned before. Think about those lagoons, the kind of enclosed areas where it tends to get anoxic and it tends to be a place with lots of runoff, so they do very well in there. And that becomes essentially a refuge for them. So as a result of this, fairly recently, uh, we had a, uh, a jellyfish you know, like educational program where we went down and tried to get the public to become aware of, if you can't get rid of the jellyfish, at least what you could do is maybe like power wash your decks and power wash your floating docks, especially before you take them out of the water for the winter. Uh, and that might kill some of the pelula and, and the, uh, the cyst forms that will appear the following, uh, following spring. Uh, we funded you know, like a zooplankton study. The zooplankton are really important. Uh, we funded uh, Jim Nichols and Ursula Housen from Monmouth University. I mentioned, before, I mentioned before that the train and impingement study that you do at nuclear power plants because it sucks all these microscopic forms of the fish and the crabs into the system. That's the zooplankton. That's the base of the food web. It's all the little children before they become you know, striped bass and, and, uh, and, and winter flounder. Uh, so we really have to get a handle on what's going on with the zooplankton. So we went out again and, and essentially sampled you know, like a transect throughout the bay and found that in general, the, the zooplankton we saw there were copepods, were shrimp-like crustaceans. Uh, they're important components of the zooplankton, and they're spring and fall blooms. So these are you know, like the amounts per 100 uh, cubic uh, milliliters of water. You can see that certain species, so these are the locations, uh, uh, site 10, site 7, site 5, and site 2. Two's in the north, 10's in the south. And that over time, you tend to have a spike, at least as far as the copepods are concerned. Somewhere, you know, like in, in, in the late to early portions of, of the spring, fresh out. Decapods, which are crabs, happen much later. Um, and plecopods, which are bivalves, you know, like happen you know, like in the fall. Um, so these, this is, these information, you know, like are really critical for us to understand, especially when the nuclear power plant goes offline, because we're expecting this to change. Because they've killed off a lot of the abundance of these species. And it would be good to know whether this might be the reason that the bivalves are declining is from the power plant and not just pollution. Um, the next environmental management area that we addressed was ecosystem-based management and modeling. Um, an ecosystem-based model is this, this is a, an approach that a lot the feds are really heavily involved in as far as you know like managing you know like large populations of complex you know like marine fisheries. Um, in this instance, an ecosystem-based model um, uh, looks at natural resource management and decision making. Um, and the way it works is that a typical model that, say, that we're developing here at the Department of Barnegat Bay develops a hydrological component based on flow, you know, like where the water goes, and water quality, which looks into nutrients affecting chlorophyll A and what happens when it moves to the system. Um, the ecosystem-based model measures biomass, it measures carbon. So we take all this data that we generated before, the phytoplankton data, we take the zooplankton data, the jellyfish data, the blue crab data, and the fish data, and we convert it into carbon. And it's, you stick it in the model as a black box, and you create these different levels of complexity, because you need lots and lots of, of the base of the food web, right? Of, you know, like phytoplankton to feed fewer zooplankton and fewer top predators. And you can do the same thing with the data that we collected to do this. But we wanted to ask the question was not so much, you know, if we reduce the amount of nitrogen, would the, water, would the DO respond in a certain way? We wanted to ask other questions, like if you reduce the amount of nitrogen, would you see less bluefish? 
or less blue crab. And you can do that with an ecosystem-based model. So the scenarios we asked them to look at, um, what are the effects of decreasing nutrient loads to Bonaga Bay on important recreational and commercial species, such as shellfish and blue crab? What happens if you turn off the Oyster Creek Nuclear Generating Station in 2019? What, could we possibly use this to develop fishery management plans? And um, so to do that, um, we ran through these different scenarios. And um, the, those are the ones I just mentioned. Uh, one of the scenarios we're going to look at is reducing nutrient loads. But this is an example of the outputs of the model. So we see here our, here's percent change in biomass. And here are the different species down here. Like cibber seabirds. We have to factor the fact that you know, things like, you know, like uh, great blue heron uh, in terms are also feeding on fish. So they have to be part of the model. Um, we have weak fish, striped bass. So if you just do the baseline run of the model, this is what it shows is that certain species tend to do well and others do not. So in this instance, <coughs> weak fish seem to be doing pretty good. Um, you know, like blue fish seem to be doing well. Atlantic croaker is doing great. Atlantic croaker is one of those southern migrant species I mentioned. They don't belong here. They're typically down in the Carolinas. You know, this is a kind of a new species that's showing up in our waters and seems to be doing fairly well here. Um, but if you then look at some other, in this instance, you see that you know, like the model predicts that you might see an increase in striped bass in Barnegat Bay. You know, but there aren't a lot of striped bass in Barnegat Bay right now, so it's kind of like trying to, this, this could be like a release from some predation and competition they find that might find this a useful habitat. But the red lines show you know, like based on the model what, what could go wrong with the system. Uh, winter flounder is, could be lost. Blue crabs could be lost. Mumma chugs and, and Atlantic Menhaden, which are on the base of the food web, could be lost. So the model allows you to kind of create a baseline and extrapolate that out to the future. Um, around the, when you uh, shut down the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant, this is the baseline. The blue crab number gets flipped, and you start to get more blue crabs. So what we know now from the model, what we can expect, at least from strategic planning, is that once the plant goes offline, we expect more blue crab to want to get bad. The question is, will we then we overuse that resource simply because more of them are there, and do we need a fishery management plan to sustain it? And that became the next scenario we asked them to evaluate. So this is a blue crab harvest control model. And so what you're looking at here is biomass in tons per kilometer, up here on the, on the left side. Down here is a, a predictive model that was out to 2030. And the baseline is based on, this is real data that we have from the, the commercial fishermen. On the dredge fishery, we have a winter dredge fishery. 44 million tons, baseline pot 210 million tons. But even sustaining where we are now, if you just go out into the future, you can see that that population is going to drop off. So this kind of indicates that we're overutilizing that resource and we should do something about it. So what could you do? The model allows you to do this. You could estimate this black line, which is what happens if you um, took the, uh, if you double the size of the dredge fishery. Well, obviously you're going to go down faster. What if you cut the dredge fishery in half? It doesn't go down as quickly. So you're doing something positive. And this is fact, this happened in, in um, the Chesapeake. The Chesapeake Bay put in a blue crab management program and essentially reduced their, their winter dredge fishery. And it, primarily, I think, it was because striped bass the, uh, were, were killing off, um, I think the, the striped bass were killing off the, the blue crab. But another scenario you could do is what happens if you double the number of pots? You essentially kill the fishery. It's not sustainable. It goes down to nothing. But if you have the number of pots, you have almost a flat line. That's, that's an extremely a sustainable fishery for the system. So this is the way you can take the model and use that to develop a management plan that our marine fisheries guys could then go to, say, like the Atlantic Marine Fisheries Council uh, and make a presentation where I can use this as, as logic and data to support that move. Uh, characterizing environmentally sensitive areas was another area that we got invested in. Um, this has to do with habitat. Um, are the differences in habitat features um, that affect the distribution of species, and specifically in environmentally sensitive areas in Barnegat Bay. Um, this is really related to Plan 10, which is to reduce boater impact you know, like on Barnegat Bay, um, but it kind of revolves around you know, the same kind of research. So is there a greater risk to ESA habitats or the bio to do the boating impacts? And I, mean, I guess I need a little backstory on this one to let you know where this came from. Was the, again, from the stakeholder meetings we had back in you know, like 2009, 2007, the public said there's too many boats on Market Bay. Maybe that's part of the problem. And if we looked at it, I think there's 50,000 boats you know, like registered in Ocean County. And 
and I'd say like 80% of them are bottom get better. And a lot of them are, are propeller boats, so they go through the system and the propellers you know, like move around. The bottom of the market bay is very shallow. So that submerged aquatic vegetation habitat I pointed out before is critical habitat which could get destroyed by, by boat wash and propeller wash. Um, so to deal with boating impacts, we felt that we didn't want to tell the public not to go in certain areas, but we'd educate them on how to slow down, in which areas you know, like were places you really would want to slow down. So we had meetings with uh, Rutgers University, we went with Mike Hennish, uh, Rick Lathrop, people here in the department, people from the Endangered Species Program who map, who map out where uh, colonial shorebirds nest, where raptors are nested in Barnegat Bay, people from the Shell Fisheries Program who know where there are scallops in Barnegat Bay, and we delineated 16 environmentally sensitive areas that we felt were places where we want boaters to slow down. Um, so the question we want to pose to them is once we set this up, we get this good backstory. Uh, we had a public meeting. We went down to Caddis Island and uh, we presented this, this proposal that these 16 essays be good places for people to slow down. Everybody you can imagine showed up. The Marine Trades Association, New Jersey Boaters Association. There is a, a personal watercraft association that came up in Florida. Um, who just, their whole perspective is don't take away my boating activity no matter where it is. And our, our approach was do it responsibly. You know, like you can do it in a place without showing up, you know, like the habitat. But one of the things they said was that they wanted a more rigorous approach to the way we delineated the 16 ESAs, which we had done essentially as a GIS exercise with existing databases. So what we thought was we could actually take all the data we collected and map it and compare it inside versus outside these 16 ESAs. And to do that, we hired um, uh, Rick Lathrop to do that. And I'll talk about his study in just a second. But ironically, we actually already had an ecologically sensitive area here in New Jersey. This is the Sedge Island Marine Conservation Zone. This is at the bottom of uh, Island Beach State Park. Uh, it was uh, delineated and turned into a conservation zone back in 2001. Uh, as a conservation zone, uh, the management rights was give, were given to the department to manage this area. So it's co-managed by uh, the Division of Parks and the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the part of the management strategy is here is that there are no personal watercraft allowed in the conservation zone. Um, uh, there are, there's no commercial fishing. So commercial <coughs> crabbers and commercial crabbers can't go in there. Recreational crabbers and clambers can go in there, but not, not you know, rec uh, commercial people. Um, and as a result, it's, you know, it was essentially set aside as a pristine area in the state. Ironically, this is driven not so much for ecological concerns, but it's like fishermen who were out there and they're trying to fly fish in this area, and people on the wave run come ripping by and flush birds and scare the fish away, so they got what they wanted. But what had happened, no one ever really went back and did an ecological evaluation of, of what the value of this zone was. So we approached um, Dr. Paul Jiboff from Rhino University, who's one of the preeminent um, blue crab biologists in the state. Paul's been working with blue crabs for like years. And I posed a, a simple thing to Paul. I said, if you evaluate blue crabs inside versus outside, to see if there's any difference. And he said, yeah, you can do that. Not only can you do that, but you essentially could drop quadrax down and essentially look for fish and other things as well to, to prepare in and outside the Sedge Island's conservation zone. And the results were, were great. You know, it showed that inside the Sims, in the Sedge Island Marine Conservation Zone, had a greater abundance of male blue crabs with a sex ratio, sex ratio that's more secure towards males, and a greater proportion of egg bearing spawning females in the mid Barnegat Bay and Western Bay locations. This means that it's a refuge. Because these big crabs and, and, and the egg bearing crabs, they're not being taken by people who are outside the system. And this is a perfect place for this because those of you not familiar with blue crab ecology, the way blue crab females spawn is they typically, when they're ready to spawn, they crawl down to the mouths of the inlets, which are the inlets right at the side here. They release their eggs on an outgoing tide, and the larvae get swept out into the ocean, and they spend the first six, three or, six or seven months free-floating out in the ocean, feeding out there. They metamorphose, drop to the bottom, fins grow into legs, and they crawl back in the bottom of the so the Central Highlands Conservation Zone is a perfect place for them to, you know, to essentially begin their life cycle. So uh, the fish sampling also showed that it was a refugia for winter and summer flounder. Um, we presented this data to the Thailand's Council in 2014 as justification for the department continuing our management of the bay. And so this was this a large part of the reason that they gave this management uh, ability back. Because a lot of people were arguing that they wanted to turn, they wanted to go in there, at least the commercial fishing, and, and scoop up all those crabs and clams. And, and so, and not do um, so that was Sedge Island. So this is, these are the, um, this is a map over here 
uh, I told you before, we, we mapped out 16 ecological sensitive areas in New Jersey. This Barnegat Bay, you see these blue boxes are the areas that we mapped out at different locations. Um, and then, so in this instance, we did is we asked Rick Lathrop and Ed Green, the milkers, to essentially look at them from all this data that we had collected before and compare data inside versus outside. Uh, Ed is a um, Bayesian statistician, so his, his interest is, you know, like, the problem is we have kind of an asymmetrical database because the data we collected for these studies really wasn't targeted at ask, asking and answering this question. So kind of throwing a lot of stuff at the wall, hoping that some of it sticks. Uh, and fortunately, it worked. Because, uh, they found two statistically significant indicators existing uh, uh, good habitat in these ESAs, and that include, include bird habitat quality and percent of submerged aquatic vegetation. The bird habitat quality is essentially the colonial shorebird nesting data that's collected by the department every year. Our ornithologists go out and they map where these birds are, where they're nesting, and so it's a really robust database. We also have data from uh, Joanna Berger from Rutgers University who's been studying terms for like 40 years, so we have a long-term database. But also this SAV is critical, so here we have one indicator is, is terrestrial, which is the bird nesting areas on land, and the other is in the water, so it's kind of a good start. They're still working on this study right now. Uh, they're going to be done at the end of this year. And this is a really interesting slide to present on why this related to boating. This slide here is an aerial photograph of the area right behind you know, like Island Beach State Park. And what you're looking at is a shot through the water. This is a submerged aquatic vegetation bed. But you see it's crisscrossed with all these lines. Those are prop scars. Those are boats who went through the shallows and essentially cut up the bottom. And what Rick did was they, he had his students go in and they essentially attenuated these and made them red. So you can see the concentration of the boat scars you know, like are, are, are huge. You know, like it's, it's giant lawnmowers going right through the SAV beds uh, into the system. You can also see that they seem to be congregating in certain areas of the bay, some are worse than others. This area up here is actually right behind Island Beach State Park near Tyson Shoals. Tyson Shoals is, is, is an area which essentially right behind Island Beach State Park is a fisherman walk that you can drive your boat in, park it, walk onto the barrier island, walk across to the ocean, and it was set up to allow fishermen to go over and throw rods in the water. This turned into you know, what I call you like a track of nuisance. Uh, on any given weekend in the summer, you can get like 400 boats there who all driven their boats in and they chopped up the bottom. So it's, it's created problems. So it shows these, these boat scars that a lot of the damage is happening in this location. Um, so that's the ecologically sensitive areas. Uh, the last area that we, we developed the research projects for was supporting water quality modeling. Uh, as Gary mentioned before, Plan 7 uh, of the governor's initiative was to develop new water quality standards uh, for estuaries. And we are in, investing in funding a, a, a huge model uh, that USGS has developed for the department based on um, a water hydrodynamic model key to watershed components and water quality models, which will allow us to manage you know, like nutrients and other things that come into the bay. Uh, some of the data that we generated in this project help fine tune those models, and here are some examples. Uh, the work that uh, uh, Dave Alinsky, um, Don Charles, Bill Anaki, and Chris Summerfield and I did, you know, I, essentially looked at these salt marsh histories, the things I showed you before, we put the, the cores down to the marsh and we could date the cores and figure out you know, like how far back in time they go. Um, well, in addition, uh, we also found that the salt marshes, we, we actually can analyze the amount of deposition that's occurring in the marshes and the amount of nutrients that are being deposited on the marshes. And we found that 80% of the nitrogen that comes into the bay winds up sequestered onto the marsh. So you think of the salt marshes acting like a giant kidney. So you know, nutrients come in from Tom's River, from the Hecon River, the tide goes up, you know, particulates get spread out over the marsh, they drop on the marsh, they either stay there as particulates or they get taken up by the, the dispartina that's growing there, and it gets removed from the system. So if you're developing a water quality model, that's a loss equation. The WASP model that we were using, essentially the boundary conditions for the model was the edge of the marsh, assume that it was a bathtub. So when we got these results, we sat down with USGS, and gave that information to them, and they allowed the model to reflect the fact that there's a removal you know, like equation that goes on the edge you know, like, uh, due to the marsh losses. They also looked at denitrification. Once the nitrogen gets into the marsh, there's all these microbes. There's lots of bacteria there that eats the nitrogen, converts it back to natural gas, nitrogen gas, and releases it to the atmosphere. So there's two loss equations that really need to get involved in, in this water quality model. And the data that we generated as part of the salt marsh study like, got played into, played into that. Um, the last piece of this is the phosphor dynamics in Barnegat Bay 7s, again with David Belinsky. 
Um, when you look at the water quality data from Barnegat Bay, there's countervailing patterns of nutrient concentrations. There's high loading coming into the northern part of the bay uh, in the more urban areas uh, than there are in the south. Uh, however, we do see that there are higher concentrations of nitrogen in the north and higher concentrations of, of phosphorus in the south. So this is an enigma. The question was, well, where did the, the phosphorus come in the south? Is it the same phosphorus that came in the north and got bound up and converted and eventually shows up in the south? Or is it coming from salt marshes? Is it coming from sediments? Which again, keys into the model because the model could actually deal with fluxes on where uh, this, this material is stored. So we hired David uh, Valinsky and uh, Nat Weston um, from uh, uh, Villanova University to do a series of the flux studies for us. <coughs> And at this point, the results to date show that there's gradients of phosphate in the bay. confirmed that in the sediments, we're seeing those same kind of fluxes, but the sediments are actually act acting as a sink. So they're not releasing phosphorus to the system, they're pulling phosphorus out of the system. So which tells us that something's going on in the water column, you know, like, which may be related to the limitations on whether the phytoplankton are utilizing, say, phosphorus, you know, like initially in the north, and you know, like maybe getting transported to the south, and then through some diagenesis, you know, maybe responsible for transporting it through the system. We're not sure yet, but it's related to the model development. So where do we go with all this? Um, ideally, you know, what we want to do is want to develop a new management strategy and an action plan. Um, and I put these up here because you know, I can to remind you if you want uh, some idea of where the information is on the, the 10 point plants here. These reports are at this location on our website. And in the future, if you have any questions about that, you can't ask me because I won't be here. <laughs> uh, so you'll have to ask Gary. Um, but he'll have to <laughs> <laughs> um, But um, where we went, as Gary mentioned in the beginning, was we briefed the commissioner a couple of weeks ago on what we thought are actions that we think the data suggests. And to key you in on some of the things that we told the commissioner, these are the kind of actions that we suggested. Um, in this instance, each one of these strategies I mentioned, life use assessment and, and water quality criteria, uh, we felt that we really think this algal and macroinvertebrate indices are really worth looking into, but we think we want another year of data to validate it. So uh, we asked for more time to get more data for another year, which will keep you busy next year, Deb, so you'd be out there yeah. and making sure there's equipment somewhere. Uh, but then we also said, then establish a routine biological monitoring. We, um, we could do this ourselves, you know, like our marine fisher, our um, uh, Bureau of Marine Monitoring can go out and grab the same samples and then we just send them to a contractor who does the identification, stick it into the industry and we have the same answers so we could track over time whether the system changes based on this baseline. Uh, for characterizing environmentally sensitive areas, we requested another year of biological monitoring at the Sedge Island Conservation Zone, but this time what we want to do is we want to train our own staff to do it. Those of you not familiar with Sedge Islands, we have an educational resource center there, the Fish and Wildlife Mans, every summer. And we have people roll through every week who spend the week in an ecological heaven, you know, like the Sedge Islands. Um, but what we thought was we could do is we could have them catch crabs and have them do this. And, you know, like uh, that would be a part of, you know, like their internship process and the people who arrive there. And we get the data. And we'll be able to have a scorecard, you know, like on how this goes through in the future. So the commissioner liked that. That was kind of cool. Um, keeps our people busy. Uh, the other thing was, you know, like look for similar conservation protection for some of the other 16 ESAs. Some of them actually are really high quality areas, you know, like that are being impacted by these boating, you know, like uh, these prop wash activities. So uh, if possible, we'd like, you know, have, continue our education program to let the public know that it's really critical. Maybe put some barrels out, you know, like that alert people, slow down. Because mostly when you put drums out, it's usually in a no-wake zone, which is next to human stuff, like docks and boats. But, you know, like, people will be aware that there are nesting birds that are just as important as docks and boats. Um, we're also going to recommend setting up a spawner sanctuary for hard clams at Sedge Islands as a brood stock. We put hard clam in it now, but then people go in and they can collect them whenever they want. But you know, like, if we can take the data we have on what's good high quality habitat, stick a brood stock in there, if they do well, they could spawn and release and maybe enlarge you know, like the area that you would get that stock in other parts of the bay. And then we also want to, we recommend a change in criteria for the Blue Acres buyout of properties in Ocean County. This comes out of the salt marsh study we mentioned. The salt marshes show us that the salt marshes not only have ecological functioning, they're important for habitat for birds, they're places where nitrogen get pulled out of the system. Uh, they're also places that reduce flooding so that there are less impacts on other property. Um, right now, you know, like a lot of the uh, data, a lot of the money that came from Superton Sandy that's focused, you know, like on buyouts has been targeted at other areas besides Ocean County, simply because the property values are so high in, in Ocean County that people may not want to sell their houses. And the critical thing is that we only buy properties in lumps. 
Because we argue if you need like some numbers, you need 10, 12 houses in order to get a decent amount of land, you know, like so that you would get a bigger bang for the buck if you set it up as a, as a restoration area. But maybe in an area down here where flooding is more critical, we want these marshes to be able to migrate inland somehow. Maybe just allowing us to do that on a house by house basis might make sense. So that was a pitch that we made to the commission. Um, for natural resource assessment and management, continue monitoring of fish, crabs, hard claim, jellyfish, and zooplankton as a routine activity, especially to assess the impact of the ocean creek infestation going down. Uh, we really need to know what's going to happen after we sort of develop plans. Expand monitoring approach to other estuaries. When we told the commissioner about this, he got really excited, so he asked us to work with the Marine Fisheries Administration, uh, looking at the Great uh, Mulca River, Great, uh, Great Bay Estuary. Uh, this, these kind of assessments that I described here we did for Barnegat Bay, the department used to do all the time, back in the 70s, when I first came to the department. We would do them on a rotating basis. We haven't done them in 30, 40 years. So now we're going down to Great Bay, and the idea is maybe to try to work our way around the state and get better data from marine fisheries. For, uh, and then stock planning for blue crab and hard clam. Develop comprehensive management plans by funding fishery independent surveys with dockside and dealer sampling plan for harvest. Lastly, looking at ecosystem based management, we think this model is really valuable and useful, but you need more data. You know, there's, there's some gaps in what went into it. You know, so we'd like to take this data that's collected up here, keep feeding it into the model, and use that to you know, develop these plans. So that being said, this is my last slide. I put this one up to let you know. That's what I used to look like when I started in the department. <laughs> I want to know. I, I would like to fish for a living. She, she wanted to know why I got paid to do that. But, um, I did not grind this one up in a blender. Um, I also note that I'm giving another talk, you know, like on December 15th. Right now it's in Silver for a Large, but the commissioner is asking me to give another talk based on my experiences here at the UP. A lot of it's going to come from my book, Protecting New Jersey's Environment from Cancer Rally to the Garden State, which covers crazy stuff, you know, like with Bruce Ripple, you know, like running out fish and containers and other people out in wetlands. But, if you get a chance, I would set that data aside and uh, I'll take questions now. I know I covered a lot of ground, and I think there's a lot to be said. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, with the blue claw, are we using them? Because we have a blue claw restaurant in Burlington, in Burlington and last year they advertised we using the New Jersey blue claw because. Um, they sell a lot of blue claws in New Jersey, but they bring them from Maryland and other places too. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're usually in the off season. Yeah, I was kind of go for. I was trying to go get a social crab when it's the full moon. I just forget that. I'm not going to get it. Question. I had a question uh, going back to your slide on uh, phytoplankton, diatoms, and uh, water quality. Did you look at? Did they look at the role of tipping points? Have tipping points play in, into the equation? So you said that if you yeah. maybe okay stop uh, <coughs> the increase in, in nitrogen, that diatoms might be able to. Well, that's, that's the value of the ecosystem based model. You know, like that, the, the, the thing I showed with the, um, with the blue crab shows you know, the asymptotic you know, like decrease in the population. They use that for sustainability estimates. Tipping points are kind of an interesting you know, like concept. You know, people, it's hard to pinpoint. You know? I mean, uh, hysteresis you know, like is, is the thing where this ecosystem doesn't go back to the way it was before. Um, they know when, when we, we actually choose the, um, a criteria. You know, like we're going to have to do what's called best professional judgment, which is it's not really a tipping point. It's you know, like what's impaired versus non impaired, which is really best professional judgment on how many sensitive species would you want to lose before you think the system's going to go bad. So you could pick 75%, you could, stick, you could, you could put error bars around it, choose a 95 percentile. But you know, tipping point logic doesn't really lend itself to looking at the ecosystem like this, except on you know, like a kind of a, a 2,000 mile up in the air you know, perspective on an end of Paul, I think I speak for most of the people in this room. We're really going to miss you. Thank you for everything. Um, just a quick question. When we follow up with the closing of the uh, Mr. Creek in 2019, yeah, um, are we also going to continue to capture some of the water quality parameters as well to see what the impact of closing on plant would have, for instance, on some of the nutrients in there? Different factors, and I know this heat yeah. can affect those, whether you have a cooling water or a supply or whatever, cooling water, sour water. Um, do you think we'll still continue that? Is that something you see as well, a role that leads? We'll, we'll just keep doing their well, routine then. stuff? How far does our water quality plan go? Uh, land to 2018. 2018. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we would 
we just want to continue. Yeah. That's what I figured. Um, yeah. And I guess we would make those. It, it might get tweaked, but the level of intensity now is to capture the work that we've done before to create yeah. the model with a little bit of you know like randomness built into it yeah. for for future work. But I, I assume after the model's done, you guys will probably want to figure out how you want to tweak that model. Yeah, and something else we thought about was we did continuous temperature monitoring right. and things like right in the oyster kingdom. It might be something we would consider revisiting once the plant is fully shut down or not. So. But you know our water quality monitoring goes now for until right. 2018, and at that point we revisit any network changes. It's, it's worth noting too that the, the, the flow through the power plant is going to be four percent of what it is now. So it's going to be much lower than it is, and the thermal plume is going to be much smaller. Yeah. You'll have to be continuous, you know, like cooling there because you're going to have the rods there. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially going to become a nuclear waste disposal site. <laughs> 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 Two questions. Yeah. Um, one, as you know, the freshwater monitoring program has a long history of having multi-metric indices for right. a variety of biological communities. Right. We have people for fish, we have easy for headwaters. Um, if we are going to be having for phytoplankton. That's the idea. Um, <laughs> and you've been working with us on trying to develop um, some of those indices for phytoplankton and freshwater. What right. well, is the process here? Think will help us do that, or vice versa, if the experience of freshwater help to develop the Yeah, it's a little different. You know, for those of you, this, this might get a little esoteric. But for freshwater, um, diatom, diatom indices are utilized by the European Union to manage, you know, like waterways all over the place. And typically, the freshwater site's easier because the water flows in one direction, you know, the salinity gradients. So they develop what are called uh, weighted average inference models. So they know so much about the diatoms, you know, like you could actually have a linear model that allows you to state that, you know, like if, if you have a certain group, groups of these, 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 these diatoms that are present, that they're typically at this concentration of phosphorus that's in the water. Um, so that's a stress response model. So that, that's a kind of a one on one. With indices of biotic integrity, that's a multi metric indice where you're taking the same groupings of species. And putting them through, you know, like Shannon indices, you know, like a whole series of ecological groups, and then rolling out as a score. We couldn't, we haven't been able to develop a stress or response model at Barnegat Bay because of the salinity gradient, because the, the, the species were responding strongly to the salinity than they were to the nutrients. That's why we shifted to the IBI approach. Because you know, with the IBI approach, you can still establish, you know, like a bright line if you get good separation uh, between what you would consider like a reference condition and. Uh, so the data that Ling Rand has developed shows good separation. Um, so that's why we really want to fund her and do it for another year. Um, and if we do that, I think, you know, like from the standards program's perspective, for those of you who are not in a know this, under the Clean Water Act, we, we have water quality criteria for biotic integrity as well as specific contaminants and nutrients. So the ones you were talking about, which are fish IBI or the microvertebrate IBI, manage what's the quality of the biology in, in that waterway. So we think we'll have that with Lynn Rand's approach, with Gary Tagon's approach, if we could show that there's a linear relationship between the sense of species and nitrogen and phosphorus, we, well, you collectively, I won't do anymore. <laughs> uh, we can, that number. Um, can pick a number. We can pick a number. You know, I could say that's the, that's the nutrient number that we want to manage here. So we'll see. That is my second question, which relates to that approach Gary developed the portion sensitive species um, going down with increasing Yes, yes. Um, do you, does anyone know whether or not something like that has been used as a basis for criteria? Yes, somewhere, anywhere? Um, Looking at other states? Yes. Um, I don't think so. Most of the other um, estuary programs that have developed in their criteria is mostly related to like light attenuation, so turbidity related to getting light down to SAV right. um, and the effects of both turbidity and chlorophyll A on shading. It hasn't, I don't know if anybody's shown the link between nutrients and the biologic community specifically. This, so yeah, it's pretty, it could it's be, pretty novel. yeah, it's a pretty, it's pretty exciting. Other questions? Well, yeah, is there an organization locally that has an economic interest that could provide greater continuity in the acquisition of data and management of the bay. For example, uh, shell fishing. Uh, do, do, is there an organization that wants to collect shellfish 
that has an economic value or well, landowners? Well, we, we, our permit fees, you know, like for people who have the commercial licenses goes into a fund that we use for restoration activities. Aside from the department? Well, the economic activity, I mean, the big one, the big McGillian in the room is Exelon. Who? Exelon. <coughs> Exelon runs the Lakes Creek Nuclear Generating Station. Um, so, you know, like, I mean, they are the one that... But they have a vested interest. They have a vested interest. <laughs> well, and not studying another, something? Is there another economic <laughs> resource? Is there another economic resource? Like, we have wastewater who discharges into <clears throat> water supply, and there are different purposes, and they end up... A lot, a lot, of, a lot of the people, you know, the voter activity fees, you know, like, all those fees are funded, fund programs. Yeah, but they... I mean, we, we, use, we use the fisheries work to the fund titles. You know what happens to funds here? The short, the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is no. Okay, so is there a Barnegat Bay Institute? No. There's a partnership, but they, they're, they're, they're funded through EPA and they don't have a They do grants. So you know. that's what you need. You need a, a self-monitoring organization. Well, you know, it, on the, in New York City, on the, on the Harbor Estuary program a number of years ago, the Port Authority was invested. You know, like and when we did all the work in the harbor, they put $30 million on the table because it affected dredge spoil disposal, which affected their facilities. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of relationship you need to like find a deep pocket to do that. The only deep pocket here is Exxon. Questions? Yes? You mentioned that there's more warm weather fish that are in the Well, the data that we collected showed that even, you know, like, even the data from the 1970s compared to now is pretty much the same species. So it's more of a subtle shift, you know, like between the croaker. We know that the winter flounder is moving. Like, we know that we're seeing less of them, you know, like, we know that the summer flounder might be moving into our waters, so we might benefit from that because of the warm water. So the signal is, is small and subtle right now, um, but it's something that we've thought strongly enough uh, to really bring to the Commission's attention as you know, like to other places being able to make use of it. I know that once we showed it to the marine fisheries guys, they went to a conference down in Florida and they asked to use CANS data because it was a, a, lead, a regional signal for global warming that they've been arguing with for the, the, the fisheries council for a long period of time. Um, so in general, I think most other programs are seeing the same thing going on. I mean, we, some of it's anecdotal. We know that guys are going out you know, like in the ocean to, to, to draggers for clams that they're spending more money on gas to get farther north to catch other species. So it's something that, and, and again, Gary and I, that's the thing we told the commissioner. I said, now, I'm not here to be a polemicist about climate change and global warming. I'm telling you what the data shows. And, the data sh and this is real. You know, because this means that you know, like the future of New Jersey's fisheries is at stake. You know, like if our you know, like fishing ports can't be competitive, you know, like we, we need to plan ahead. And so, okay. but, you know, like, um, so we, he gave us some additional money to look at some other places, and we recommend you know, like, uh, additional studies to do that. You did say global warming because you retired. I said it before I retired, to tell you the truth. What's one of my problems since I've been here is speaking truth to power. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so that kind of reminded me, I did some reading, and I forgot where I read actually, but um, some power plants and uh, discharge from power plants in Florida are attracting manatees, and manatees right. are. Did you find any beneficial um, uh, effects from those? No, actually, up here, well, down there, the water's not as cold in the winter. Here, the problem is... Um, it's obviously a very different system. Well, besides, besides fish kills in the summer, they turn off the power. Here's an interesting aside. As I pointed out before, the blue crab, you know, I worked, you know, the, the females like to spawn at the mouth of the estuaries to release their spawn into the ocean current. What Paul Jibbaugh found was that during spawning period, there's a huge concentration of gravid females in the water, in the, uh, at the effluent of the plant, and they release their eggs there. So if you stick it into the water quality model, you know, like that USGS generated, and you track where the larvae would go, they never leave the bed. So what's happening is a good substantial amount of the abundance of the fishery is essentially trapped, you know, because the females think that this is the right place to be to spawn, and so the juveniles never get out of the ocean to start that metamorphic cycle that turns them back into crab. So that's one of the things I, when I showed you the slide before and why blue crabs might spike up once they shut the plant down, is that loss to the, you know, like to the ecology may be returned. The dile our dilemma is that the management, because based on what happened after we opened up the shellfish beds, people be thrown, you know, like blue crabs and all like fruit species, you know, like if they were all the trash. Questions? Any more questions? Thank you. This is what we've been up to for the past three years. <laughs>